Welcome to our webinar today, Join Our Journey, The Road to Wellness. Our webinar is Adrenal Insufficiency and High-Dose Steroids. And I'd like to start by introducing myself. I'm Kathy Olewski, and I'm the new 2020 Educational Webinar host. I'm bringing the patient perspective to the webinars this year. Before my diagnosis, I was an athlete. In my professional life, I own several martial arts schools, which my husband, son, and I operate together. I'm an eighth degree black belt in karate and have been teaching martial arts for 40 years. I think my story may sound familiar to many vasculitis patients. I went to 13 specialists before some lab work indicated that I was in kidney failure. My nephrologist ordered an ANCA test because he had just been to a seminar about vasculitis. The next step was a kidney biopsy that confirmed the diagnosis of ANCA vasculitis back in 2008. So once under treatment at the UNC hospitals in North Carolina, I had my kidney function restored to an acceptable level through plasmapheresis, steroids, and several different drugs, including cytoxan, imuran, and rituximab. I was in treatment for six years, and I've been in remission off treatment for six years. And in my life in remission, I still teach martial arts, but not as many classes as before. I write a monthly column for an industry magazine. I'm a blogger for Black Belt Magazine, and I'm a speaker at conventions on topics of teaching martial arts, women's empowerment, and how to run a business. And I've been lucky enough in remission to travel as far as Australia and New Zealand as a professional speaker. And now let me introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Lynette Neiman. Dr. Neiman is a senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and she's the head of the Endocrine Consult Service at the NIH Clinical Center. Dr. Neiman is an active clinical investigator with 11 protocols. Her research interests include disorders of cortisol deficiency and excess and female reproduction. She's authored more than 280 publications and sponsored three investigational new drug applications, one of which was, was, which was licensed in the U.S. and Europe. She's received the NIH Director's Award, the NIH Clinical Teacher of the Year Award, and the Endocrine Society's Distinguished Physician Award, and has also provided congressional testimony. Dr. Neiman served as the president of the Endocrine Society from March 2017 to March 2018. Welcome, Dr. Neiman. Great. Uh, thank you, Kathy. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk to all of you about adrenal insufficiency and high-dose steroids on this webinar uh, presentation. I have no financial conflict of interest uh, with this particular topic. This is an outline of what we're going to speak about today. We're going to have a quick refresher on the adrenal physiology, um, a discussion about clinical features and causes of adrenal insufficiency, why we might be using steroids for treatment of a disease versus replacement doses of steroids uh, to replace daily cortisol, and then uh, how we get off steroids, when and how. And the question comes up, what if I have to take steroids again? We'll discuss that. So uh, the adrenal cortex is what we call the outer level of the adrenal gland. The, we have two adrenal glands. They sit on top of each kidney. And in the bottom of this slide, you can see the layers as we would look at them on a, a slide under the microscope. So the glomerulosa layer is the most out, outermost layer. The fasciculata, where the uh, steroid cortisol is made in humans is in the middle. The reticularis is the most inner layer, and it makes other kinds of steroid hormones. The medulla is the part of the adrenal gland that makes the stress hormones uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And so you can see that we have steroid hormones that are associated with each of these layers. Aldosterone is the hormone that in people, it governs mineralocorticoid function. That means that it's the hormone that governs our salt and water metabolism. Cortisol is a glucocorticoid, and it, as we'll talk about, uh, governs fuel metabolism and is important in stress. And DHEA is a very weak androgen, which is the name of male hormones, and so we can think of that as a sex steroid. Okay, 
doctors take advantage of the anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressant actions of high doses of cortisol to use other glucocorticoids to treat disease. Next slide. The right amount of cortisol in our bodies is very critical. When we have too much cortisol, we have a condition called Cushing syndrome, which is involved uh, with uh, a lot of excess weight, uh, excess fat distribution in unusual areas, immunocompromise because the high dose of steroids actually suppresses the immune system, and a variety of other uh, signs and symptoms. When we have a normal amount of cortisol, it's like Goldilocks, we just have it just right. And when there's too little cortisol, we have a condition of adrenal insufficiency, which we're going to talk more about today. I want, before we talk about adrenal insufficiency, to talk a little bit about how cortisol production is controlled by the body. Uh, this Understanding this is really important to understanding why high doses of steroids cause adrenal insufficiency, and that is something that does happen in patients with vasculitis who receive these high doses. So let's walk this through this very slowly. On the left, you can see the name of the various glands that are involved in the cortisol production, and that is the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal glands. And we abbreviate that by calling it the HPA axis. Each letter for one of, stands for one of those uh, glands. So the hypothalamus, which is located in the brain, makes a hormone called CRH, or corticotropin-releasing hormone. That hormone goes down that little in, invagination, that little tiny area between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. We refer to that as the stalk. So CRH goes down the stalk and meets the cells in the pituitary gland that make ACTH, or corticotropin. ACTH is then secreted in the blood and travels to the adrenal glands, and it promotes the production and the secretion of cortisol. And you also can see that at the bottom, the adrenal glands also make aldosterone that we referred to earlier. That's mostly under the control of a hormone called renin. So let's go back up to looking at the uh, adrenal glands and how the cortisol affects the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. There is something that we've referred to as a negative feedback system, meaning that cortisol levels are sensed by the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. And they recognize when there's plenty of cortisol around, so they stop making CRH and they stop making ACTH. And in that way, cortisol regulates its own production. When the ACTH and CRH levels fall, cortisol levels also fall, and the hypothalamus and pituitary glands sense that there's not enough cortisol at some point, and they rev up again, making more CRH and more ACTH. So this feedback loop mechanism is very important in understanding the physiology of uh, cortisol in the normal body and in states of cortisol deficiency or adrenal insufficiency. Another very important characteristic of cortisol is that it's not secreted in the same amount all the time. As I mentioned, it turns its own production off and when it does that, ACTH levels fall. And then as HCTH levels increase again, cortisol levels rise. And the 24-hour pattern of that relationship is shown on this slide. You can see that in the nighttime when we're sleeping, cortisol levels are very low. So cortisol levels are shown um, in that blue line, the heavy blue line across the screen. And then during the the nighttime cortisol levels start to increase under the influence of increasing ACTH levels. And then in the early morning, as you can see with the sun on the right part of the screen, cortisol levels are the highest and then they slowly fall over the course of the day until they're the very lowest just after we go to sleep. So this is not really time to the clock of the day. If people have nighttime jobs and they go to sleep in the morning, the pattern really follow, follows our sleeping pattern rather than the light and dark pattern of whatever we're doing. Secondary adrenal insufficiency is a condition in which there's a problem with the receiving of ACTH at the adrenal gland. This can be caused either by a problem in the hypothalamus with decreased CRH or a problem in the pituitary gland where it cannot make and secrete ACTH. 
The end result of either of these situations is that ACTH levels are very low and they're not sufficient to cause normal amounts of cortisol production. And so we have a situation where cortisol levels are low and patients have all the signs and symptoms of adrenal insufficiency that we're going to discuss. Next click. I'm showing just for your reference because those of you who read about adrenal insufficiency will encounter the term primary adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease. This is a situation where the problem is in the adrenal gland. So it can't make very much cortisol because of an intrinsic problem with the gland itself. And as a result, there is less negative feedback of cortisol. So CRH and especially ACTH, which we measure in the blood, those levels are both very high to try to stimulate cortisol production from the adrenal gland. As you might imagine from looking at these two situations with secondary and primary adrenal insufficiency, we can pretty much distinguish between the two of those by measuring ACTH levels. In secondary adrenal insufficiency, ACTH will be low, reflecting the inability of the pituitary gland to make enough ACTH. And in primary adrenal insufficiency, ACTH levels are high, reflecting the, the attempt by the body to increase cortisol levels from an adrenal gland that is destroyed or unable to make cortisol. Next slide. So the most common cause of secondary adrenal insufficiency is the use of glucocorticoids. But the glucocorticoids in this situation are being used in high doses. They are much higher doses than the body would normally make. And you can understand that because if the body always made high enough doses to cause secondary ins adrenal insufficiency, that would not be good for the patient. So these are always high doses of steroids that are being given. Now, glucocorticoids is the name for the class of compounds that have actions like cortisol. So these can be any whole host of different kinds of medications. Most commonly, you'll think about prednisone or dexamethasone or methylprednisolone as being the kinds of agents that are used in these high doses. It's also important to recognize that chronic use of these glucocorticoids, which I'll refer to as steroids, even though there are other compounds like sex steroids and aldosterone that are also steroids. But for the purposes of this, it's just easier to say steroids. So chronic glucocorticoid or steroid administration can be either topical, meaning on the skin. It can be inhaled, like an inhaler for uh, bron bronchitis or for asthma. It can be given by mouth or orally. It can be given intraarticular, which means into a joint, or it can be given parenterally, which means intravenously or uh, uh, as a injection someplace. The types of medications and compounds that, that contain glucocorticoids are not just prescription medicines, but they may be over-the-counter uh, medications, particularly over-the-counter creams or ointments. But it also includes things that we don't typically think of as medications, such as skin bleaching creams, which are used worldwide to lighten people's skin, um, certain tonics in parts of the world that may have a steroid in them, and then herbal preparations may be uh, laced or um, have other things that are steroids added to them. It's also important to recognize that some drugs that we use for other purposes have some steroidal qualities, and that would include something called magestrol acetate, which can be used in HIV or burn patients, medroxyprogesterone acetate, cyproterone acetate, and opiates. And this last is a very important uh, and more recent understanding that we have that when people take high doses of opiates for pain relief, they sometimes can suppress the adrenal axis. And, and sometimes doctors are unaware of how much of these medications patients are taking. And so the cause of the adrenal insufficiency is not very clear. Just to give you an idea of the kinds of signs and symptoms that we see in our patients with adrenal insufficiency and how primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency differ in the way the patient presents to us. Uh, this is a very old graph from 1990, but it, it hasn't, things haven't changed very much over uh, the ensuing um, many, many years. You can see that the most common 
cause, or the, sorry, the most common sign of adrenal insufficiency uh, in patients with primary adrenal insufficiency uh, is weight loss, GI or gastrointestinal complaints, weakness and fatigue, followed by hyperpigmentation, hypotension, hyponatremia, and hyper, hyperkalemia. Uh, the, the more uh, lay language for that is uh, hyperpigmentation is when the skin gets darker, hypotension is low blood pressure, hyponatremia is low sodium levels in the blood, and hyperkalemia is high potassium levels in the blood. Now, those are the main things for primary adrenal insufficiency. For secondary in adrenal insufficiency, only the cortisol is affected and not the aldosterone. In primary adrenal insufficiency, there's a loss of aldosterone, and it's oftentimes much more severe in terms of the glucose. It's oftentimes more severe in the amount of cortisol deficiency, so the symptoms are more extreme. In yellow, you can see that the percent of people with these symptoms who have adrenal insufficiency is less, secondary adrenal insufficiency is less than those with primary adrenal insufficiency. So in secondary adrenal insufficiency, we see um, weight loss, GI symptoms, which might be nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, or perhaps something as vague or subtle as a lack of appetite. We see weakness and fatigue. We do not see hyperpigmentation. That relates to the high ACTH levels in primary adrenal insufficiency, which are not present in secondary. We sometimes see low blood pressure, sometimes low sodium. We never see high potassium. We don't see salt craving. We may see some dizziness. We may see some musculoskeletal pain. And we rarely see hypercalcemia or high calcium levels in the blood in either form of adrenal insufficiency. But you can see from these uh, symptom frequencies that it can be sort of hard to make the diagnosis of secondary insuff adrenal insufficiency based on signs and symptoms alone. Well, so you might say to me, okay, doctor, my disease needs steroid treatment. Well, what determines the dose and type of steroid that I need? And now we're switching over into the whole issue of high-dose steroid treatment. So when we treat a disease with a high-dose steroid, we're usually, as I mentioned earlier, using um, steroids such as prednisone, and these are long-acting steroids. They have a long half-life in the blood and a long half-life in the tissues. And we use these steroids because we want to be sure that there are high levels of the steroid in the tissues. This is in contrast to hydrocortisone, which has a relatively short half-life, and so we don't want the amount of treatment to change during the, time, the course of the day. We want to be able to give the doses and know the patients well treated at all times. We choose a dose and adjust the dose to keep the underlying disease under control. So the focus is the disease being treated and not whether the patient's getting enough cortisol or not because we're giving a very high dose of a cortisol-like steroid. Because of all of these issues, the type of steroid that is used and the dose that's used has to vary amongst patients because the dose and the type of drug is individualized. This is one of the areas of medicine where we actually do have personalized medicine. We're trying to give the right dose for that patient for that problem, and there isn't a one-size-fits-all kind of a dose. Next slide. And then you might say to me, well, doctor, I'm taking all these steroids, so I don't have any signs of adrenal insufficiency, so how does my doctor know if I have secondary adrenal insufficiency? And that's pretty straightforward. We know that in general, if you have taken more than twice a normal daily replacement dose, meaning you're taking double the amount of a steroid that you would normally be producing in your blood, and you take that dose for more than two to three weeks, that secondary adrenal insufficiency is a possibility. You can sort of remember that by thinking about secondary as being a two, two second, you know, secondary is a second. And then we have a lot of twos here. We have twice normal and two to three weeks. So just remember the twos. That pretty much defines what's happening in secondary adrenal insufficiency. Now, moving on, because high doses of steroids are needed to have this treatment effect of blocking inflammation or blocking uh, the immune system, so anti-inflammatory or immunosuppressive effects, 
while the high dose is being taken, it's not possible to have symptoms of adrenal insufficiency because you're taking a high dose of steroids. But we know because of the high dose and the length of time, we know the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is not normal. We know just by the dose that the patient has underlying adrenal insufficiency. It's just not expressed because the patient's taking the medicine. Instead of the effects of secondary adrenal insufficiency, what we oftentimes see are the effects of excess glucocorticoid, which we could term Cushing syndrome. And those are weight gain, brain fog, emotional cognitive problems, and many other problems that we could talk about in the question session if you're interested in hearing more about that. So let's just pause a bit in terms of um, the talk and talk a little bit about what are some tips for healthy living when you're taking, again, high dose or treatment doses of steroids. So you want to try to maintain your weight because weight gain is common when we're taking high dose steroids. It's a Cushing's-like situation. We know that the immune system is knocked down. That's the point of taking these um, drugs. So patients are more likely to get infections. So here in the day of coronavirus infections and concerns and worries, you have to do all the things you want to do to prevent infections normally. You want to wash your hands and wash your hands properly, very thoroughly, and not just a, just a quick wipe and a, and a rinse. It's important not to touch your face because we transmit infections oftentimes into our body by touching our eyes or our nose or our mouth where the mucous membranes are so it's easy for viruses or bacteria to enter the body. It's really important for everybody on steroids to get the flu shot. And if you're at the right age and you have the right kind of underlying disease where it's recommended to possibly get the pneumonia shots or the shingle shots. It's important to exercise. We know that high dose steroids makes muscles more weak and exercise can help to counteract that. And if you're taking high dose steroids for more than a year, it's important to talk to your doctor about whether you should have measurement of bone mineral density and whether you should have treatment to either prevent or to treat osteoporosis. And osteoporosis is a technical term for low bone density or weak bones that where you would be more prone to have a fracture. And at a minimum, it's important to take enough vitamin D and calcium by mouth in your food or by supplements to help pr promote and protect your bones against the, the effects of the high-dose steroids. Next slide. Well, then you're going to say to me, well, so, doctor, if I can't have adrenal insufficiency symptoms when I'm taking this medicine, what's the big deal? What's the issue with this? Why do I have to even know about adrenal insufficiency? Well, because of the side effects of the high-dose steroids, these Cushing's kinds of features, uh, and weight gain and immunosuppression, the doctor is going to want to reduce the dose of the steroid and possibly stop altogether as long as your underlying disease that's being treated remains stable and does not flare. That's one reason. The doctor might want to stop the steroids, and you have to know that you might have adrenal insufficiency once the steroids are stopped. Also, patients sometimes forget to take their medicine, and sometimes they run out of their medicine. And in those situations, you might develop the symptoms of adrenal insufficiency because, as I've mentioned, the brain has been down-regulated and can't secrete ACTH, and then you, meaning you can't make a lot of cortisol if you stop the steroids. So the question then becomes, when and how can I safely stop these steroids? So in general, if someone has taken more than twice the daily dose of hydrocortisone or twice the normal daily dose of hydrocortisone in the uh, in another kind of a drug. And we have equivalents of how much prednisone is equal to twice the daily dose of hydrocortisone, for example. If you've taken that dose for more than two to three weeks, secondary adrenal insufficiency is, is quite definitely a possibility, as we just discussed. So to avoid this, as well as a flare of the medical conditions that the steroids are treating, usually the doctor will taper the steroids. This is a term that we use when we reduce the dose of steroids gradually. And tapering can be done in many ways. Next slide. Generally, though, you reduce the dose as quickly as possible over days to weeks to sometimes months, as quickly as possible as you can without having a flare of the symptoms of the underlying disease. So you can see right away that from one patient to the next, when we start to try to taper, we have no idea how quickly it's going to go. 
We can have some idea based on the dose, how high a dose the patient's taking, but it can still vary. Two patients on the same dose can take different amount of time because their underlying disease might be different. So if that's possible, you can reduce the dose down. When the dose is close to or at a normal replacement dose, now replacement dose means the normal amount your body would make, the normal amount I would give somebody if they had adrenal insufficiency from their adrenal glands not working. When we get close to that point, we want to use hydrocortisone. The reason for this is hydrocortisone can be uh, given in very small doses, and so we can dose adjust better with hydrocortisone than with any other of the glucocorticoid drugs that we have. So as we're trying to taper down, we can do very, very little changes week to week and still be reducing the dose. As a doctor, we're going to check for the severity of the adrenal insufficiency by measuring the cortisol, or we might measure ACTH to see how low it is. And we'll look at that and decide how long it might take to come off steroids or whether it's safe to come off. We'll keep the patient on a replacement dose, again, not a treatment dose, of hydrocortisone until the testing shows that the HPIA axis has recovered. If we have a patient on a replacement dose of steroid, the re the axis can recover because there's not too much steroid being given. And then, again, if a flare occurs, we have to increase the dose because, again, the real reason for giving these steroids is to treat the condition. So we increase the dose, stop the flare, and then we repeat this. We might not be at as high a dose as we were before, but we have to, again, try to taper down and see what happens. Next slide. Well, then you'll say to me, whoa, let's say I get off of them. What if I have to take them again? And again, the same principles apply. We use a high dose to get the medical condition under control. Actually, we endocrinologists don't do this. The, the physician treating the disease does, and they use whatever dose they need to get the medical condition under control. And then they taper and stop when the HPA axis is recovered unless there's a flare of the underlying disorder. And many times they call, at least here at the NIH, my colleagues will call on one of us endocrinologists to help them with the taper because sometimes it's not clear uh, how fast you can taper and how you manage the hydrocortisone when you get close to the normal dose. So the other question is, what happens if you have to start taking steroids again? Will they still work? And it's important to recognize that people don't usually develop a true immunity to high-dose steroids themselves. But the underlying disease can change, and that might require either a higher or a lower dose of steroids to bring it under control. So when people think, oh, I'm having to get such a high dose on my second go-around with steroids, it just may be that the underlying disease has gotten a lot worse, so it takes more steroid to fix it. Next slide. So let's now talk a little bit about tips for feeling well if you're taking replacement steroids. So here we're giving generally hydrocortisone. It's short acting, so it can be given two or three times a day to mimic the normal cortisol levels in the blood. We think that's important for people to feel well, to have similar doses um, or similar levels uh, that they would have if they were making their own cortisol. Now, Hydrocortisone is cortisol, so that's how we can actually think about it. We just want to give the same amount of cortisol as what you would normally be making. One tip is to take it as soon as you wake up and not to wait for breakfast because we know that people's levels rise while they're sleeping and the highest levels are in the morning. If you wait a few hours to take the dose, you're not going to get that high level that we normally have when we wake up. And then we usually give a second smaller dose sometime in the afternoon. And generally, we tell our patients that it's okay to adjust the timing of that from day to day. So if you find that you're more tired later in the afternoon, you can take it later in the afternoon. But if you find you have to do a test or do something to, uh, something where you feel like you're exerting yourself a lot earlier in the afternoon, you can change the time. And some but not all people take a third, even smaller dose in the early evening, but we caution not to take it too late or it can disrupt sleep. Next slide. And again, just to remind you about our picture at the bottom of how the normal levels of cortisol would um, be occurring in the blood during the day. And we want to influence 
um, the choice and schedule of glucocorticoid replacement um, by in ways that will mimic normal physiology. So we use hydrocortisone, which is cortisol itself. We replace the daily amount of cortisol being produced. And here at the NIH, we have a relatively conservative replacement um, algorithm. We use a body surface area uh, dose uh, adjustment. So we give 10 to 12 milligrams per meter squared per day. Now, if you go to the internet, you can plug into calculators for body surface area, your height and weight, and to find out how many what your millimeter squared is per day, and then divide, multiply that by 10 to 12, and that would be the dose of milligrams we would typically here give for hydrocortisone. Other physicians give slightly higher doses. We um, prefer to avoid slight over-treatment because it can lead especially to osteoporosis and low density of the bones. And generally, we give this in uh, two times a day or sometimes three to mimic the diurnal pattern of cortisol. Next slide. And here is just a little uh, picture. The dark black line is showing you the levels of cortisol in most people who are awake at day and sleeping at night. And you can see the dotted or ha uh, dashed lines are the levels we get in the blood when we take hydrocortisone three times a day. And you can see that this mimics in an imperfect way, but in, in, in some way it is closer to the usual variation that we see of cortisol in the blood. Uh, it mimics it much better than a long-acting steroid, which would give us similar levels at all times of the day. Next slide. Now, there are some important things to do when you're taking replacement steroids or even high-dose steroids. You want to um, wear medical, uh, medical alert jewelry and carry a card that identifies you as someone taking steroids. Uh, either when you're taking high-dose steroids, if, for example, they don't know that and they don't give you the steroids, you'll go into an adrenal crisis because you don't have any steroids. But if you're on replacement dose, you will also get sick, and you, so you need them to know what it is you're taking and what the dose is. You want to ask your doctor about how to adjust the dose of medicine if you get sick, and this pertains just to replacement dosing. We do not change dose of treatment steroids when you get sick. So generally what we say is if you're sick and you have a fever, you double or triple the oral dose of your medicine, depending on the amount of your fever. Double for a small fever and triple for a severe fever. Uh, we also recommend increased IV doses if you're having something more dramatic going on, such as surgery or a severe um, body injury, automobile crash, for example. But generally the stress dosing or sick day dosing, which is two words that refer to the same thing, is not needed if you're on high-dose steroids because you're already getting really high doses. You don't need to double them or triple them. Um, I'd like to take any questions you have, but first, Kathy, I was wondering, you know, as a patient, have you had issues or anything that you think is very important to talk about to really um, get at the patient experience and the things that patients worry about with this? Well, I have, actually, and I... I just want to say, first of all, that was just fascinating to me. <laughs> Somebody that was on, I was on steroids for uh, on and off mostly for six years, and I didn't know any of this information. I just did what my doctor said, and I, I feel like this is so helpful. And, and so, yes, I, um, Dr. Neiman, I would say that that was so interesting to me, and I learned so much, and I do have some questions particularly um, from me, I mean, it's it's great for me now that I'm in remission, but I think about all the time if I have another flare and going back on steroids. So I have questions and a lot of the patients have submitted some questions. But for me, I wanted to ask you, when I was first diagnosed and hospitalized, I was given a thousand milligrams of steroids by IV, along with my first chemo treatment, which I think was cytoxin. Um, I was also going undergoing plasma phoresis at the time. My kidneys were in, you know, pretty bad shape. I was in kidney failure. And uh, at the time, I remember being warned that there could be future ramifications of the high dose of steroids and the the chemotherapy that I was receiving. And um, I'm in remission now, but I wonder all the time if I should be on the lookout for some issues related to high dose steroids, you know, it's it's 
six years later, I don't know that anything's happening, but should I be concerned? Right. So after a single dose, almost no matter how high it is, the body metabolizes that and um, there aren't really long acting, long lasting um, adverse effects from that. Uh, the real problem with the higher dose steroids is when they're given over a long period of time. The body's pretty good at um, it responds to steroids, and then it, once the steroids go away, it really reverts back. Uh, most of the body reverts back pretty quickly to its usual state. The, the hypothalamus and pituitary are a little unusual in that it takes them a while to wake up again. But um, I wouldn't particularly worry about the long-acting uh, results of that dose of 1,000 milligrams because Whatever they was they gave you, it's long gone, and and you've probably got plenty of other things you worry about. So that's one thing I think you can take off the worry list. Well, that's nice to know. Uh, and can you tell me what what is high dose? I I took steroids. I don't know if I was, I just didn't know enough about what I was doing. Just I just did what my doctor said. So what is high right. dose steroids? Is what's low dose? What's normal? Right. Well. Almost anything that's being used to treat a medical condition, by definition, is going to be a higher dose than the normal replacement dose because you're trying to get that anti-inflammatory or anti uh, um, or, or immune suppression effect of the higher doses. So in general, a replacement dose of hydrocortisone might be somewhere between 50 and 20, sometimes 25 milligrams a day total dose. Prednisone, somewhere between three and a half and six or seven, maybe for a really overweight person. Um, dexamethasone, we tend not to give as a replacement dose because it has very variable um, absorption and metabolism. So we don't know what's the right dose for any one given person. So, if, if you, but if you take hydrocortisone and prednisone, if a replacement dose average, let's say, is five milligrams. Most patients with um, vasculitis or other disorders where we'd be giving prednisone to treat them, they're almost always taking 20 milligrams or more to start, initially at least, to, to suppress the disease. So you can pretty much think if you're taking more than 10 milligrams of prednisone a day that you're on a, pretty, you're on a high dose that's sufficient to suppress your normal pituitary function. Yes, I was on a high dose. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, it is interesting to learn all these things and, and to learn uh, what, why uh, you have to taper down because I, I didn't understand that. I did have, I, I don't remember what we called it. It seemed like they called it a storm of something, but I, I was just so, so, so ill when I was trying to taper down and they slowed me down to what I thought was just a crazy taper for taking forever and ever and ever, but it's what I had to do. And uh, I guess I understand it now after having seen your presentation. Um, I would like to ask you some questions from some patients though, because I think they have uh, quite a few really good questions and, and some of them made me remember these things also. Let's start mm -hmm. with the first one is um, from one of the patients. She says, I know there are many patients in our vasculitis community have, who have concerns about adrenal insufficiency. Some have said that they don't think doctors test for AI very often. Is there a test? What type of doctor would do this test uh, if necessary also was her question. Yeah, so um, in general, if, once, if someone is currently taking high doses of steroids, we just know they have secondary adrenal insufficiency. We don't have to test. Where the question I think comes into play is when we're tapering and you wanna know has the secondary insufficiency gone away? And for that, we can use a variety of tests. If you, I, I sort of sometimes joke around with my fellows that if you ask five endocrinologists how to do this, they'll give you 10 or 20 different answers. And so there's no one right way, but one way, a simple way, is just to measure the cortisol in the blood in the morning before the patient takes their high dose of steroid or to have them hold some of their um, doses the day before. So for example, if you're close, if you're at a replacement dose of hydrocortisone, you can have the patient hold their afternoon dose and come in in the morning so that whatever cortisol you measure in the blood is the cortisol the patient's making. Again, remember that hydrocortisone has a short half-life, so it would not be present as 
you the medicine hydrocortisone in your blood in the morning. And so we'll measure a cortisol level. We know what the morning level should normally be. It's generally 10 to 20 or so micrograms per deciliter. And if the patient has a lower level than 10, then we think that they probably still need to be on hydrocortisone. If they have a level in between 10 and 18 or so, um, or let's say 10 and 17, we'll say maybe they don't need it. And then we can do more fancy testing to determine whether they can come off of the hydrocortisone. Most people think that if a morning cortisol is 18 or more, that that indicates they have normal adrenal function and they can just stop their medicine. Uh, but it, it's a very, um, it can be sort of tricky, and that's why I think a lot of um, rheumatologists or pulmonologists or other doctors who treat patients with high doses of steroids, they'll oftentimes refer them to us, to us endocrinologists, to sort of help with that tapering, that final bit of tapering that goes on. So that was extremely helpful. I know that I never did that. Uh, I know that we, <laughs> we just tapered and I told them uh -huh. how I felt and they said, we'll change mm -hmm. it to this. And it seems like a scientific answer is way smarter. Um, I, I guess that that answers one of the other questions I got from somebody, which is, should you, if, if you're feeling bad trying to come off of steroids and you're tapering the way your doctor tells you to, uh, should you request being seen by an endocrinologist to help you come off of them? Wouldn't that seem to be a great answer? Yeah, um, although so the physicians who uh, are not endocrinologists who do this a lot um, also vary quite a bit in how comfortable they are with that process. And, and I know people here who will, and in the community, who will uh, respond to that patient and say, oh, well, better go, better increase your dose for a little bit until, you know, you start feeling not so bad because that probably was symptoms of adrenal insufficiency. And then they'll keep the patient on the dose and maybe taper a little bit more slowly, just like your experience was. And it is okay to taper and just follow patients clinically. I think sometimes you can get patients off steroids a little faster by doing some blood measurements um, because I think you're more cautious and conservative when you're not. But it also can be just fine to do tapering via just clinical observation. A good clinician is many times worth much more than a bad clinician with a blood test. Understood. Well, that that's a great answer also. Um, one of the patients that I spoke with said that um, I actually was surprised to learn that there are some patients with vasculitis whose doctors have tried to taper them off prednisone but were not successful. These patients are often told that they'll be on prednisone for the rest of their lives. Do you have some comments for those patients? Yeah. Um... So I've seen, I'm sort of the court of last resort here to some extent, and I, I've seen a number of patients that quote unquote cannot come off of steroids. And I've been able to get almost all of them off, not everyone. The reasons when people can't come off, sometimes it's because the dose is being tapered too quickly. And sometimes it seems like the patient has gotten used to a higher dose. And so if you come down too quickly, not their disease, but the patient themselves uh, just feels poorly and oftentimes will dose adjust themselves back up to a higher dose. And so when patients readjust to a higher dose, they resuppress their pituitary gland and then again, you have to start over again and go slowly. Uh, sometimes the underlying disease makes it difficult to get patients off. And sometimes they're, particularly with people with pulmonary disease, I've had the experience of really having to taper extremely slowly over time, not being able to taper quickly. So it's very person and disease specific. I would say that many patients, it's worth trying to get them off by doing a very slow taper if it seems that they can't come off. If even with a slow taper they flare, then they may have to stay on steroids for a long time, whether that's the rest of their life or, or whatever. I mean, one always hopes that there'll be more specific treatments coming down the pike that will help people. But until something better comes along, if the disease keeps flaring before you can get to a normal replacement dose, um, you know, the only option you have is to continue treatment. Well, that's, 
That's also helpful to learn that. Um, another patient in a very, very similar question, but a little more um, concerning. She said, I'd like to know why emergency personnel will often refuse to give us our solu solucortif injections when we mm -hmm. provide them in emergency situations and ask them to do it. And she said also she'd like to know why so many endocrinologists do not think having an injection kit is necessary. She sort of feels like it's a matter of life and death. Yeah, so again, I like to divide this into the need for injections when you're on high-dose steroids and when you're on replacement steroids. So if you're on high-dose steroids, the only reason you need to have an injection is if you, you're unable to take your steroids. So in the case of an automobile accident, on being unconscious, um, having surgery, things like that, you would need to have an injection because you're not able to put that pill or pills in the mouth and take them. Um, even on high-dose steroids, if you have one day of vomiting, probably is enough high-dose steroid around to sort of keep you going. But on high-dose, any patient on steroids who requires steroids, uh, for replacement. So that would be the people on high dose steroids who are taking more than replacement and the people who are taking replacement steroids because they're down to a level where they can, they're waiting to taper off and get off the steroids. Either of those situations, if the patient has a prolonged period of time where they can't take by mouth or their medicines don't stay put. So let's say you can put something in your mouth but you're having diarrhea or vomiting, you're not going to absorb the medicine. In those situations, it is important to take, sure to have available and to know how to use an emergency kit for injection. Uh, our posture here is that we teach the patient and we teach the patient's family if the patient feels squeamish about it, how to give an injection. And if they don't want to do that, we tell them to be in touch with their physician. And generally, the need for an emergency injection in that situation is because of an illness. So uh, a gastrointestinal illness, um, a GI flu, throwing up, um, having diarrhea where you don't think the pills are being taken in, uh, or having something happen where the patient is really unable to take the pills because they're... Uh, not aware enough to get up and take the pill. So sometimes people can be so sick that they just forget about getting up and doing the right thing. So though in those situations, it is important to take an injection. I think it's great not to be dependent on emergency personnel because occasionally this does happen because they don't want to take the responsibility. And what they'll usually say is they'll get you to the emergency room quickly enough that somebody there can assess the need to give the injection. Um, I think if a patient is concerned enough that they need an injection and they've had this experience with the EMT personnel that probably they should have somebody teach them how to do it. And it's not very hard. It's just something that people aren't used to doing on a daily basis. So there's different ways of approaching the situation. Some of my patients don't like to give injections and, and they assure me they can get to their doctor's office or an ER quickly enough. Um, and if they won't learn how to do it, I can't force them to do that. But I'm nearly all of my patients, um, and I treat disease conditions, Cushing syndrome, when you treat it, patients take a while to recover their HPA axis, and they are sort of like, they are people with secondary adrenal insufficiency, so they get treated the same way. And um, the, almost all of them learn to give the injection. And interestingly enough, the patients with Cushing syndrome that I take care of very rarely have to actually give themselves an injection. So it, at least in that setting, it seems not that common. So Dr. Neiman, also uh, some patients would like to know, what do they, do patients need to know about adrenal insufficiency, like around surgery? Are there any particular risks or precautions they should take? Uh, right, so patients with adrenal insufficiency uh, generally receive additional doses of steroid if they're not on a high-dose steroid already when they go to surgery. There is a lot of controversy within the endocrine community as to whether this is really necessary, but I think the common practice now is to uh, 
um, to replace with additional doses for those patients who are receiving replacement doses of steroids. So for a patient on a high dose who's on a treatment dose, that would be continued, but it would probably be converted to an intravenous dose until the patient's able to take things by mouth. For patients on replacement steroids, we usually give increasing doses of an intravenous steroid, and the dose that we give will be different depending on how uh, severe the surgery is. So, for example, with just, let's say, dental surgery, we usually just double the dose given by mouth. But if somebody were going to have full-blown cardiac bypass surgery, we might give 50 to 100 milligrams of hydrocortisone every six to eight hours for the first 24 hours and then gradually taper down. I think that uh, the practice in this is moving more towards lower doses of these high doses, so if that makes any sense. Instead mm -hmm. of giving 100 milligrams, we might give 50. Um, I currently rarely give more than 25 milligrams every eight hours when my patients are having chest surgery, which is a reasonably moderate to severe type of surgical procedure. And I think that's because we realize that the really, really high doses can also suppress immune function, and we want the body to be able to respond to the surgery with a proper um, anti-inflammatory uh, response and a proper immune response. And giving very, very high doses for long periods of time is probably counterproductive. But it's important for patients on any dose of steroid to tell their surgeon and their doctor about that so that the doctor can make a decision based on their personal situation about what is the right dose and how long to give it. So I, I presume from that, we had another question about how to prepare for an ER visit. It's basically the same thing, is to just communicate with the uh, doctors if you're going to the emergency department about your steroid usage and what your therapy you're on, and, and they'll take it from there. Yes. And um, to that end, uh, it is that is the reason why we recommend to all our patients to wear some sort of a medical alert jewelry. There's a lot of different um, uh, ways to get that. I mean, there are different manufacturers and different suppliers of that. But in general, it means you're wearing something on your body that is engraved with something that says, I'm a patient and look for my card. And the card that people should be carrying in their wallet should identify what drug, what is the drug and what is the dose that they usually take. And the reason why we say that is that um, none of us ever anticipates being in an accident. And we often usually go to the emergency room when we're awake, aware, and able to communicate. But if we can't communicate for ourselves and no one is, who knows us is with us, then this medical alert jewelry in the card um, tells the providers that this is some, there's something different with this patient. And even if it's just a piece of jewelry with the red cross on it, it, we all know that means look for a card someplace that will give us more information. That is so interesting. All those years that I was on steroids and I never thought about that, but that is, you know, great, great advice. I, I want to thank you so much for answering all of these questions today. I know they'll be extremely helpful to um, vascularized patients everywhere who are listening to this. I'm glad to be able to help. It's just a very, um, it, it's a hard part of endocrinology for a lot of people because it's just so variable and you have to have a certain amount of judgment for each patient. There isn't an algorithm or a one-size-fits-all for these kinds of questions. So, yeah, so I mean, you know, sometimes the endocrinologist can't do much to help because, you know, the therapy is driven by the primary disease and what, you know, just what the patient has to have for that. But when it comes towards the end of either being able to taper steroids or or even being able to look out for the side effects of high doses of steroids. Sometimes the endocrinologist can be very helpful. And a lot of things happen with high dose steroids that, that maybe aren't being addressed by the primary doctor who's really focused on what he's, he or she is treating and not so much on the side effects of the steroids. So sometimes an endocrinologist can be helpful with that. Um, when a physician who's treating patients with high dose steroids isn't clear about what to do, we endocrinologists are, are standing ready to be helpful in any way we can. And also, I think it's very important for patients to have an understanding of the underlying physiology and what's happening to their body when they're taking these steroids because 
it is something that I think a lot of people find very confusing and sometimes understanding what's going on makes it less confusing and more understandable when the doctor is saying to do this or do that if you understand a little bit about what's happening. So I hope that I achieve some of those goals today and that um, this will be helpful to the population of folks who have vasculitis and um, they'll feel a little more comfortable with what's being done in terms of their treatment. Well, absolutely. And I, I very much appreciate you being on here with us today. I think we'd like to wrap up by saying uh, thank you to our sponsors. We are extremely grateful to GlaxoSmithKline and Genetech who are helping support the webinars. I also want to say that the go-to resource for patients with vasculitis is the Vasculitis Foundation website. It's a great educational and supportive resource to help patients better understand and manage this complex disease. You're not alone. You can find information on all the various forms of vasculitis, order disease brochures, use the find a doctor feature to locate medical professional or centers that treat vasculitis. You know, in 2020, there will be a series of regional conferences throughout the country. Visit the website to learn when, where, and where, and then these one-day conferences will be held. And also, please check out our video educational library under the Learn tab. Here, you can watch past webinars. You can actually watch this webinar when we put it up in the short future. And we have video presentations from some of our conferences and also the 2019 symposium. So there's a lot going on with the Vasculitis Foundation, and I'm going to recommend one thing you should do today. And here it is, the one thing you should do today is to get you plugged into everything that's happening with the Vasculitis Foundation. Subscribe to our monthly digital newsletter called the VFE News. Every month it's delivered to you as an email. I encourage you to go there after this webinar and subscribe today. Our next issue of the VFE News is coming out very soon.